Welcome to Growing Deeper. I'm Reverend Michael Jakes. You know, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 10 that the Spirit searches the deep things of God. On our program, it is our desire to bring you to those deep places through a careful study and inspection of God's Word. So join us right now as we grow deeper in the Word of God. May God bless you. Well, praise the Lord. So glad you could join us. This is lesson number six, part two in our series on the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Now, as we left off in our last uh, lesson, in part one, uh, we were speaking about the Holy Spirit. And we said that the Holy Spirit is always in control of true prophecy and directs attention to Jesus at all times. We said that prophecy is never to replace the written word of God. Okay, we said that the Bible says that prophecy will cease, but the word of God will abide forever. And finally, we said that the Bible warns of false prophets. And because there are false prophets, God's word provides several ways to identify true prophecies. Now, let's begin part two uh, of this lesson by discussing uh, ways to identify true prophecies. You can recognize them by number one, doctrinal error. Doctrinal error. In Romans 12 and verse 6 it says, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, where the prophecy let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith. Now, the phrase in Proportion to faith means in right relation to the faith. So the way to recognize true prophecies is by whether or not they agree with the basic doctrines of the Christian faith revealed in the Bible. That's very important. For example, false prophecies, rather false prophets, do not confess the deity of of Jesus Christ. Okay, we read in 1 John 4 and verses 1 to 3. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Whereby know ye the Spirit of God? Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God, and every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of Antichrist. Okay? Very important. Very important. We also know that false prophets teach sexual immorality and permissiveness. Second Peter chapter 2 verses 1 to 3 says, But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false prophets false teachers people even as there shall be false prof false teachers among you who privily shall bring in damnable heresies even denying the lord that brought them and bring upon themselves swift destruction and many shall follow their pernicious ways by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of and through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you. Ladies and gentlemen, this goes on more than you know. This goes on more than you know. We also know that false prophets try to lead people away from obedience to God's word. Okay? This type of prophecy is not in right relationship with or to the Christian faith. Well, number two, uh, in ways that you can detect, ways that you can detect and identify true prophecies is through deceiving signs. Deceiving signs. False prophets deceive people with miraculous signs. The Bible says it with miraculous signs. The Bible says that many false prophets shall arise and shall deceive many. For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets and shall show great 
and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very so much that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. That's from Matthew uh, chapter twenty four, verse eleven and twenty four. Number three ways to uh, detect a false prophet, or, or rather ways to identify a true prophet. And prophecies is bad fruit. The evidence of spiritual fruit is the true test of any ministry. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Ye shall know them by their fruits. Matthew seven fifteen and sixteen. Number four. False claims. Any prophet who claims to be divine or the same as Christ is false. Let me repeat that. Any prophet who claims to be divine or the same as Christ is false. He is a liar. The Bible says, Then if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. For there shall arise false Christ and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Matthew 24, 23 and 24. Finally, there will be unfulfilled prophecies. This probably in, in modern terms of how the church has come to define what a prophet is. This is the capstone. This final this, this final one is the capstone. Unfulfilled prophecies. The final test by which a true prophet can be identified is whether or not what he or she has prophesied comes to pass. If what they say does not happen, they have lied. They did not hear from God. Let me read from Deuteronomy 18 verses 20 and 22. Mark this in your Bible. But the prophet, which shall presume to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or that shall speak in the name of other gods, even that prophet shall die. And if thou say in thine heart, how shall we know the word which the Lord hath not spoken? When a prophet speaketh in the name of the Lord, if the thing follow not, nor come to pass. That is the thing which the Lord hath not spoken. But the prophet has spoken it presumptuously. Thou shalt not be afraid of him. Don't listen. Don't worry. Don't hear what they say. So prophecy can come from three different sources. From three different sources. Prophecy can come from the human spirit. We're going to talk about each one. From the human spirit. Prophecy can come from evil and lying spirits. And obviously, evil and lying spirits. And obviously, prophecy comes from the Holy Spirit. First, let's speak about the human spirit. The fact that prophecy can come from the human spirit. In Jeremiah chapter 23. In verse number 16, it says, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Hearken not unto the words of the prophets that prophesy unto you. They make you vain. They speak a vision of their own heart and not out of the mouth of the Lord. Let's go to Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 13 Verses 2 and verses 3. Ezekiel chapter 13, verses 2 and 3. Son of man, prophesy against the prophets of Israel that prophesy. And say thou unto them that prophesy out of their own hearts. Hear ye the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God. Woe unto the foolish prophets that follow their own spirit 
and have seen nothing. In other words, they have seen no vision. They are speaking from their own spirit. Okay. Next, prophecy can come from evil and lying spirits. First, let's go to the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 18. Isaiah chapter 8, verses 19 and 20. 8, verses 19 and 20. Isaiah chapter 8, verses 19 and 20. It says, And when they shall say unto you, Seek unto them that have familiar spirits, and unto wizards that peep, and that mutter, should not a people seek unto their God, for the living to the dead? To the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. So you see what it says. If they do not speak according to the word of God, there's no light in them. They're not speaking from God. They're not speaking from uh, uh, revelation of the Holy Spirit. They're speaking from themselves. Let's go to the book of 1 Kings. 1 Kings. Chapter number 22, and starting in verse number 22. First Kings, chapter 22, verse 22. And the Lord said unto him, Wherewith? And he said, I will go forth, and I will be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. And he said, Thou shalt persuade him and prevail, and prevail also. Go forth and do so. So, evil and lying spirits okay people that do not have any light in them sometimes wind up speaking words of quote prophecy and they have not heard from God they have not heard from God finally obviously prophecy comes from the Holy Spirit let's let's go to uh, 2 Samuel 2 Samuel Chapter 23 and verse number 2. 2 Samuel chapter 23 and verse number 2, which simply says, The Spirit of the Lord spake by me, and his word was in my tongue. And this is the nature of prophecy. The Holy Spirit is with you, he is in you, and you speak as he has spoken unto you. And you tell forth and proclaim the word of God. Let me quickly go to Jeremiah. Chapter number 1. And verse number 9. Jeremiah chapter 1. And verse number 9. Which says. Then the Lord put forth his hand. And touched my mouth. And the Lord said unto me. Behold. I have put my words in thy mouth. Once again, a picture of a prophet. A picture of one who speaks and tells forth and proclaims the word of God. So, we've given you uh, the fact that prophecy can come from these three sources. This is why we must judge prophecies to determine whether or not they are from the Holy Spirit. We must we must. Now the Bible gives many examples of Old and New Testament prophets for us to study to increase our understanding of prophets uh, and the gift of prophecy. Now I'm just going to give you just a few, uh, just a few names and where they can be found, and it would be helpful uh, if you study these references uh, yourself. Number one, you have Abraham in Genesis 20 and verse. Seven, you have Moses in Deuteronomy 34 9. We're talking about these individuals in their prophetic capacity. We're talking about Habakkuk chapter 1 and verse 1, Isaiah in 2 Kings 19 and 2, Micah in Matthew chapter 2, verses 5 to 6. Just going to give you just a few. Uh, let's speak about several of the Old Testament prophetesses Miriam in Exodus 15 and verse 20, Deborah in Judges 4 4. Huldah in 2 Kings 22 and 14, Noadiah in Nehemiah chapter 6 and verse 14, and Isaiah's wife 
in Isaiah chapter 8 and verse 3. Of course, we know of the New Testament prophets, Jesus in Matthew 21, 11, John the Baptist in Matthew 11, 7 to 11, Agabus, who we have spoken about previously in Acts 11, 27 and 28 and 21, 10, Silas in Acts 15, 32, Judas in Acts 15 and 32, not Judas Iscariot, and the leaders from Antioch in Acts 13, 1. And finally, the New Testament prophetesses. Anna in Luke 2.36 and Philip's daughters, which we have spoken about in part one in Acts chapter 21, verses 8 and 9. So study the guidelines for using prophecy. Also, it's important to study the guidelines uh, for prophecy when the church meets together uh, in 1 Corinthians 14, verses 29 to 31. That's very helpful once again. Once again, we said previously in another lesson that everything needs to be done decently and in order. God is not the author of confusion in the churches. Okay, now let's move on to evangelists. Okay, an evangelist has a special ability to share the gospel with non-believers in a way that men and women respond and become responsible members of the body of Christ. The meaning of the word evangelist is one who brings good news. That's what an evangelist does. That's what an evangelist is called out to do. Now, the word evangelist occurs three times only in the New Testament. In Ephesians, it is lifted as is, it is listed as one of the uh, special gifts, or as we have spoken, the special uh the ministry leadership gifts of the church in ephesians 4 11. timothy timothy is told to do the work of an evangelist in second timothy 4 and verse 5 uh, paul told him but watch thou in all things endure afflictions do the work of an evangelist make full proof of thy ministry now although all believers are to do the work of an evangelist and share the gospel with others god gives some this special ministry gift of being an evangelist. Philip was one who had the spiritual gift of being an evangelist. So, so once again, all of us are called to evangelize, but some are gifted to be an evangelist. Okay? there. So there we see uh, the difference. The evangelist is essential to God's purpose for the church. And a church that fails to support the ministry of the evangelist will gain fewer converts than God desires. Okay? Gain fewer converts than God desires. Okay? The evangelist is someone who has a burden for souls. And the evangelist is someone who has a need, has a desire to see individuals come into the kingdom. Okay? It is not a title that you just place upon someone uh, for whatever reason there may be. They are people who are naturally inclined, or supernaturally inclined uh, to preach the gospel, to see souls brought into Christ. This is their heart's desire. They pray for souls. They cry over souls. They are concerned with souls. This is the heart of an evangelist. And they will be easy to spot. They'll always be talking about salvation and how people need to be saved and how Christ wants to save. And they'll always have a word for those who don't know Christ. They have a heart that is out and open to those who don't know Christ. That is an evangelist. Okay? They are gifted. They are anointed. They are appointed. They are commissioned to proclaim the gospel to everyone, to everyone. Now, Philip is actually the only person in the New Testament called as an evangelist. He spoke, he, he spread the gospel, and he shared the gospel. His tendency towards this gift was evident from early in his experience with Christ. When Philip met Jesus, the first thing he did was to share the news with Nathaniel. Uh, we read in John 1, 45 and 46, Philip find Nathaniel 
and said unto him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael said unto him, Can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? Philip said unto him, Come and see. Later Philip directed spiritually hungry Greeks to Jesus. The same came therefore to Philip and desired him, saying, Sir, we would see Jesus. And Philip cometh and telleth Andrew, and again Andrew and Philip tell Jesus. That's from John twelve twenty one and 22. Philip was chosen as a disciple. He was in the upper room when the Holy Spirit came. Philip was ordained by man as a deacon in the church, but set by God as an evangelist. Now, you can further study Paul's, uh, rather Philip's ministry, uh, as it will it will expand your knowledge of the gift of being an evangelist. Okay, let's run down the things that you can study and scripture you can read concerning Philip that will enhance your knowledge of the gift of evangelism, or rather of being an evangelist. His message in Acts eight thirty five. His deliverance, miracles, and healings in Acts chapter 8, verses 5 to 8. Uh, the fact that he baptized in Acts chapter 8, verses 12, 36 to 38. He preached the kingdom of God in Acts 8, 8 12. His house was set in order in Acts 21, verses 8 to 9. He traveled to spread the gospel in Acts 8, verses 4 and 5, and verses 26 and 40. He had the ability to persuade groups. In Acts 8 6. He stirred entire cities in Acts 8 8. He ministered to individuals in Acts 8 27 and 38. He was led by God in Acts 8 26 and 39. He had a knowledge of the Word of God in Acts 8 30 and 35. And he was known by effectiveness of ministry and response of people. Acts chapter 8, verses 5 to 6, verse 8, verse 12, verse 35 and 39. So all of these things, when you read them, you find out the type of individual Philip was. But not only that, it is a profile of what an evangelist is and what they do. Now, let's move on to pastors. Now, let's move on to pastors. The Bible says... uh, Ephesians 4.11 once again, and he gave some pastors and teachers. Now, Ephesians 4.11 is the only place in the King James Version of the New Testament where the word pastor is used. The Greek word pastor actually means shepherd. Pastors are leaders who assume long-term personal responsibility for the spiritual welfare of a group of believers. Now, because the word means shepherd, Pastors should follow the example set by Jesus Christ as a pastor or shepherd of his people. We read in Hebrews 13, 20, Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, we read in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 4, And when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. Jesus also referred to himself as the good shepherd and listed some of the functions of a true shepherd in John 10, uh, verses 1 to 18. Now the Bible mentions the office of a bishop in 1 Timothy 3. Now many believe, and this is true, uh, that this is the same as a pastor because of the following verse spoken by Jesus. For ye were as sheep going astray, but are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls. That's from 1 Peter uh, chapter 2 and verse number 25. Now, the task of pastors is to help believers grow up into Christ. Pastors function as shepherds, of which Jesus Christ, as we have spoken, is the good shepherd. Uh, Pastors are absolutely, let me stress, pastors are absolutely essential to God's purpose for his church. The church that fails to select godly and faithful pastors will cease will cease to be governed according to the mind of the spirit. 
the spiritual requirements for bishops, elders, and deacons, which were positions of leadership in the early church, should certainly also be met by one who would lead these people as a pastor. Let me just, let me just mention that the pastor, the bishop, and the elder uh, in biblical terminology are all speaking about the same person. Okay? You can study these in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 to 13. So the responsibilities of a pastor are to spiritually feed, as we have spoken, and protect those under his ministry. This is to be done with the proper motive and not just for financial gain. Okay, he is to be a shepherd and not a hireling. A hireling, a hireling is someone who is there and does what he does strictly for the money. Who is there and does what he does strictly for the money. Strictly for the money. That is not a true shepherd. That is not a true shepherd. We read in Acts chapter 20 and verse 28. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. We read in 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 2 to 4, Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready, but of ready minds. Filthy lucre is talking about money. Neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being and samples to the flock. In other words, don't lord yourself over. You're not to be a boss or a king over God's people, but you are to be an example. And finally, it says, And when the chief shepherd shall appear, you shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. The word pastor is used in the Old Testament only in the book of Jeremiah. Here, God gives special warnings to pastors. The pastor also transgressed against me in Jeremiah 2 8. In Jeremiah 10 21, it says, For the pastors are become brutish and have not sought the Lord. Therefore, they shall not prosper, and all their flocks shall be scattered. We read in Jeremiah chapter 12, verses 10 to 11 about pastors. Many pastors have destroyed my vineyard, they have trodden down my portion underfoot, they have made my pleasant portion. A desolate wilderness. They have made it desolate, and being desolate, it mourneth unto me. The whole land is made desolate because no man layeth it to heart. Woe be to the pastors that destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, saith the Lord. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God of Israel, against the pastors that feed my people, ye have scattered my flock and driven them away. And have not visited them. Behold, I will visit upon you the evil of your doings, saith the Lord. That's from Jeremiah 23, verses 1 to 2. So, study the requirements for being a bishop or a deacon in the church, as we've spoken about in 1 Timothy 3, and verses 1 to 13. They also apply to the one who serves as a pastor. Okay, so that is necessary that you know... Uh, uh, what qualifies one for being uh, a pastor. Finally, teachers. Teachers are believers who have the special ability of communicating the Word of God effectively in such a way that others learn and apply what is taught. Teaching involves training, not just communicating information. The Bible records... In 1 Corinthians 12, 28, and God has set some in the church, thirdly, teachers. Ephesians 4, 11, he gave some teachers. Romans 12, 7, or he that teacheth on teaching. Now, not all believers receive the special gift of teaching. Paul asks, are all teachers? The answer to this question is no. God gives some the special gift of of teaching. Now, the special gift of being a teacher differs from the speaking gift of teaching just as being a prophet differs from the speaking gift of prophecy as we have borne out previously. You recall in Acts 13 verses 1 to 4 that showed teachers in a special leadership position along with the prophets. 
in guiding the ministry of Paul and Barnabas. All believers do not have the special gift of teaching or the speaking gift of teaching, but all believers are to be involved in teaching the basic gospel message. Okay? Once again, let it be emphasized. All believers do not have this gift. Hebrews 5.12 For when the time ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God. So Paul, uh, the writer of Hebrews is saying, he said, you should be teachers yourself. You should be teaching other people, but you still are in a stage where you need other people to teach you the, the basic principles of the word of God. Okay, so he's exhorting them. You should be teaching yourself. You should be teaching others also, rather. All mature believers ought to be involved in teaching the gospel, whether or not they have the special gift of teaching or not. Now, the Bible specifically warns of false teachers. These are people who claim to have the gift of teaching, but do not teach the true word of God. Teach the true word of God. Second Peter 2 1. But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that brought them, and bring upon them shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that brought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. Very telling scripture that we are living in this day. 2 Timothy 4, verses 3 and 4. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers, having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned unto fables. Ladies and gentlemen, this is what's going on in the church today. People have itching ears. They want to be told uh, how good everything is, how good they are, how they can be better, how they can, how how they can do better, how they can have more. The, these are itching ears, okay? And the people want to hear these things. They don't want to hear about sin. They don't want to hear about judgment. They don't want to hear about what the word says. Just tell me how to increase myself, how I can feel better and do better. It says they shall turn away their ears from the truth. And be turned unto fables. Isaiah forty three twenty seven. Thy teachers have transgressed against me. Second Peter chapter two in the book of Jude lists some of the personal characteristics by which you can recognize false teachers. Take time out. Read those chapters. Second Peter chapter two and the entire book of Jude will give you a profile, an outline, a description of false teachers. Now. It is possible to have a wrong motive for teaching as well as false doctrine. Titus 1.11 says, Whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. Once again, for the sake of money, people will teach what they feel they have to teach in order to keep money to get money. Those who have been taught God's word should teach Faithful believers who will be able to teach others. Galatians 6.6 6, Let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things. 2 Timothy 2.2 2, And in the same thing that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. This is the pattern of continuous teaching that, if followed, rapidly multiplies to spread the gospel throughout the world. One of the problems is that people, because people have itching ears, uh, if the message, if the word does not tickle their fancy and scratch their itching ears, then it's a word that they do not want to hear and they prefer not to hear. This is why there is such an illiteracy uh, of the word of God in the church. People who don't know the word because they don't want to learn and hear and sit and be under uh, teaching. 
but it's one of the signs of the times. A person with the spiritual gift of teaching does not teach man's wisdom. Does not teach man's wisdom. We read, which things also we speak not in the word, which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Another point, a teacher should have godly understanding. Another point, a teacher should have godly understanding and wisdom. Paul warns against those who are in 1 Timothy 1.7 desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor whereof they affirm. A teacher stresses the importance of teaching with wisdom. Christ in you the hope of glory whom we preach, warning every man. Christ in you the hope of glory whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. That's from Colossians 1 and 27 and 28. Teachers must live what they teach. We read in Romans 2, 21 and 22. Thou therefore which teachest another, teachest thou not thyself. Thou that preaches a man should not steal, dost thou steal? Thou that preaches a man should not steal, dost thou steal? Thou that sayest a man should not commit adultery, dost thou commit adultery? Thou that abhorrest idols, dost thou commit sacrilege? Very important. Next, teachers will be judged on the basis of what they have taught. James chapter 3 and verse 1. My brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. In other words, everyone should not desire to be a teacher. Because teachers have a greater, will have will receive greater condemnation because of the nature of the call. They have other lives in their hand. They are teaching the word of God. And it must be taught properly. And it must be taught with reverence. And God will judge. If a teacher does not do it according as scripture says. Now, let me give you a few examples of teachers in the New Testament and who you can study uh, and learn from uh, learn from these individuals. In a, uh, Acts chapter 18, verses 24 and 25, we read about Apollos. In Acts 18, 26, we read about Aquila and Priscilla. In Acts 20, verses 20 and 21, 27, and 21 and 28, we read about Paul, obviously the great apostle Paul. And we read about Peter in Acts chapter 5, verse 28 and 29. In closing out uh, this particular lesson, in closing out uh, this particular lesson, uh, let me just give a word on leadership working together. The five special gifts of leadership function together in the ministry of the church. Now, apostles extend the gospel message to various regions and raise up organized bodies of believers. God gives special miraculous signs and wonders to assist in this extension of the gospel. The apostle provides special leadership to the churches he raises up. Prophets also provide leadership in the church. One of their functions is to give special messages from God through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Evangelists communicate the gospel in such a manner that people respond to it and become believers. They may minister individually or in large groups, but their ministry always produces new believers. These believers then come under the care of apostles, prophets, pastors, and teachers of the church who guide their spiritual development. We have given the example of Philip in Acts chapter 8. He brought the Samaritans to Christ, then turned them to the apostles for further teaching. We have pastors. They exercise long-term leadership and care for those who have believed through the message of the evangelists. They provide pastoral care to those who have become believers through the ministry of apostles. 
Their ministry is a picture of the ministry of apostles. Their ministry is a picture of the loving care of a shepherd for his sheep. And finally, we have the teachers who provide instruction which goes beyond the presentation of the gospel by the evangelists. They teach believers to be spiritually mature. They train faithful people who are capable of teaching others.